Oh, that's, that's cool. That's my cue again. Test this thing out. There we go. That was my fault, not Sean's. He would want me to say that from the stage. I'm not used to this. I told him, I warned him this would happen because I'm not used to this, like, uh, this Britney Spears thing going on here um, because I don't dance and you'll never see me dance. Um, but we've got uh, something really cool to do uh, and, and take you guys through this morning. I'm going to have some guests with me in a few moments, but we are in week five of a series uh, through kind of the the first few chapters of the book of Revelation, and we are talking about these messages that Jesus enthroned has for John the Revelator in this series of dreams. And he basically says, I want you to write these letters to these churches. And this week we are talking about the church in Sardis, the church in Sardis. And I'm going to read that for you, and I'm going to do a really quick teaching on it, and then I'm going to have some guests join me, and I'll kind of explain why. This is Revelation 3, verses 1 to 6. This is Jesus speaking. He says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. In other words, the messenger of the church of Sardis, or probably the church leader in Sardis. And this is the message from the one who has the seven, sevenfold spirit of God, and the seven stars. And so the seven stars are basically symbolic for these seven churches. So it gives you the magnitude of who God is, right? Like if you can hold cities and churches that are symbolic of stars in the universe in your hand, you are a God who is just almost um, too much to behold. He says, I know all of the things that you do and that you have a reputation for being alive. Well, this doesn't sound like it's going anywhere great. But you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and first believe. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I wore my white hoodie this morning, just so you know. I'm holy, you know. Um, I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and, my, and his angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Church, let's pray and open our ears to listen to what the church or to what the Spirit is saying to our church this morning. Almighty God, we just give you these next few moments to not just hear from your word, but to hear about what you are doing, not just in our community, but in places around the world. God, what can we glean in this kingdom movement that is happening all around us and all throughout our world? God, teach us the ways of being an apprentice to Jesus. Not what it means to just wear the label Christian, but to follow hard after what you are doing 
in and around our lives to be more and more like you, to love and live like Jesus. And all of God's people agreed and said, amen. Any, any of you, either when you were a kid or maybe even still today, uh, sleepwalk? Rick, raise your hand. A few of you, there's like probably about maybe a dozen or so that I've said like, yeah, sleepwalk. My brother used to sleepwalk and it would happen probably like once a month or so, and I'm not sure kind of all the physiology behind it, but there are these, I, we used to have these hilarious stories about my brother sleepwalking. He once went into um, my parents' room, he sleepwalked and went into their room, and uh, he climbed onto their dresser and stuck his arms out, and he said Superman, and literally jumped on their bed while they were sound asleep and just scared the life out of them. And there was another, uh, my brother had lots of issues and that's a story for another day. Um, most of you know the kind of story behind my brother who just passed a few years ago, but um, there was another time where uh, he ha- happened to have like a little like a uh, Swiss army knife or something in his room and he, he, he like he splayed it out or whatever and literally stood in the doorway of my parents' room with a knife just silently holding it. And so they were like, we were just terrified. We didn't know what was happening. So some of us sleepwalk. And like when we sleepwalk, uh, crazy things happen, right? Like we have no, the person who's sleepwalking probably has no control over what is happening. Um, but sleepwalking is this crazy thing. And, um, you know, it's not always doing what is created to do. But here we see in the scripture that sometimes it seems like the church is asleep. And the church doesn't know what it's doing. It's not accomplishing what it's created to do. These things are happening, but we're sometimes not completely aware of our surroundings. Now, for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about my hope for the church. And I believe um, I was at a conference in Orlando this week, and uh, business, not pleasure. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't even get a tan. I'm still white as this, yeah, I'm invisible under the city. Um, that's how, I, so um, yeah, I went to this conference and uh, it was about church planting, which God has not called me to be a church planner, but as church planting, multiplication and discipleship. And some of this discipleship stuff uh, really like spoke to me and I, just, I thought it was great. And I thought I actually had a word for the church. And so I was like, well, that doesn't really happen to me very often. So that can't be true. And so the more I thought about it, and, uh, we're gonna be interviewing some, some friends here in a minute, but I've actually felt like I had a word for you. So I was like, well, I better share it. And so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, Cause I believe that the church is kind of like a sleeping giant. I truly believe that the local church, like you and all the other ones, I believe that we are the hope of the world. And I don't mean that Jesus isn't the hope of the world. I just mean that when Jesus is doing what he wants to accomplish in his church, and and we are ready and willing to do that thing and to live that mission, I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. I truly believe that. And when, when, when we say things like, you know, on, on, this, uh, on this church, on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Sometimes it feels like hell is winning. Sometimes. And so what, what does that tell me? What does that tell you? What does that tell us? And I think that kind of speaks to what Jesus is saying to this church here. I believe that sometimes the church is like a, like a sleeping giant. We, we are this movement this great powerhouse in the world that is taking a nap. And sometimes we poke and we prod at it, hoping that it's going to do the thing that Jesus has built it to do. Yet sometimes it doesn't feel like that. I read this great quote by Dallas Willard. It'll be up on the screen behind me. He says, The greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs. Do you have that quote in there? Uh, Emily, I don't want us, us to miss this. The greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who, either by profession or by culture, are identified as, quote, Christians, will actually become disciples, students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of, the he- of heaven into every corner of of human existence. This is where I feel like the church might be asleep, like a sleeping giant, is there are many of us who wear the label Christian, and we profess that. We have given our lives to Jesus. We're coming to church. We're tithing. We're serving the church. We're talking about Jesus outside the church. But then there are those who wholeheartedly, with every fiber of their being, want to live and love like Jesus. That's the hard part. 
and for those who, in every fiber of their being, want to love and live like Jesus, to apprentice under him, to see what he says, to do what he did, to live like he lived, that right there, that is how you awake a sleeping giant. And so I want to have um, something practical, and I thought a lot about this this week, is there are these requirements to make this happen, and it actually happens, we see it here in Revelation 3, 2. In Revelation 3, sorry, uh, verses 1 and 2. He says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Like, what does, what does that even mean? What are these requirements? How do we wake a sleeping giant so that we can begin to see the church live and move in how its mission and how it's created to bring the mission of Jesus forward? What would it look like for a great move of God in your life? What would it look like a great move of God in our church? What, what would it look like for a great, like I'm talking like crazy revival type stuff. What would that look like to happen in our church, our city, or even our country? And so uh, I thought of these three things as I uh, read this text. And the first is this, become biblically literate. Read your Bible, which sounds ridiculous. It sounds crazy that we would have to be reminded as followers of Jesus to read our Bible. We are sometimes so busy reading books about the Bible that we forget to read the Bible. We are sometimes so interested in reading about someone's opinion about the Bible that we don't read the Bible. We're sometimes so interested in doing studies and like getting together in groups of people and talking about what this person thinks about the Bible and we're not, we're not reading the Bible. This is what it says in verse 3. This is Jesus saying this to John in the dream. Go back to what you heard and believed at first and hold to it firmly because what was heard was recorded. And what is believed of Jesus has been document, documented, inspired. Where? In the Bible. Go back to what you heard and believed at first and hold to it firmly. A return to making the scriptures a necessary, not an optional or a practical way, but a necessary part of our daily lives. Um, through our disciple uh, series, as we've been trying to train people to be able to disciple others in these kind of small groups, uh, we have, we watch this video, which is always really interesting about the, the more you read the Bible, certain areas in your life and around you come to light and you are able to deal with them through God's word. We need to return to making scriptures a necessary part of our everyday life. Look, you're not going to get it right. You're not going to read the Bible seven times a week. Sometimes for some of us, that's not going to happen. That's okay. But pick that thing up, right? Dust it off. Crack the little gold leaf pages. That's always like that satisfying like crinkle when you open your Bible. And read it. Stop listening to people like me talk about the Bible and read your Bible. What is God saying to you? through scriptures. Don't take, it's like LeVar Burton. Don't take my word for it. It's in a book, right? Reading Rainbow, anybody? You 90s kids? So the first is become biblically literate. Second thing is this, practice repentance. Oh, he said the R word. We don't like that one. Second thing is practice repentance. This is what Jesus says in verse three, repent and turn to me again. Make repentance a, a part of your prayer life. And that's not to like shame you because we are imperfect people, okay? We mess it up. We say the wrong thing. We, we, we do the wrong thing. We make the wrong decision. We, we offend somebody. This stuff happens. And it's okay to say, Jesus, I'm sorry. And, and repenting is not just asking God for forgiveness for the things that you may 
or have done or said in your life. But then he says, and turn to me. That is when you repent, you're literally turning your back on darkness because you are looking at the light that is Jesus, the light of the world. So practice repentance. Be okay that you're going to mess up sometimes and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Third thing is this, pursue holiness. There's a good old Methodist word for us, pursue holiness. I grew up in the Nazarene church. Where Anyone know the motto for the Nazarene church? Pastor Eric's got to know it. Holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. Right? Like, it's this thing where it's literally in our mission statement as a church to love and live like Jesus. That is holiness. In verse 4, it says, There are some in the church in Sardis, as Jesus speaking, who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. White is symbolic for what? Purity and holiness. Pursue it. That's what Jesus is saying. Like, there's some of you who are walking in purity and walking in holiness. Do that. Pursue holiness, and that is be with Jesus, be formed by Jesus through the Scripture and the power of His Spirit, and love and live like Him. This is literally what we're teaching people in our disciple class. Be with Jesus. Be in your Word. Okay? Be formed by Jesus. Live in love like him. Pursue holiness. If you want to know more about those things, you can simply go to cro.ca slash groups. If you, and if you want to join um, our next kind of uh, semester of disciple training or even follow training, we would love for you to be a part of that because that's where we believe the foundation of the church is, is being discipled by Jesus so that we may disciple others and that they would disciple others. That is how you poke a sleeping giant. Because church, we are pretty comfortable in our brand new seats. And it's great for us to come and gather and worship together and learn together on a Sunday. It's like my favorite day of the week. I'm not saying that because I get paid to say that. It's truly, I love when we get to do this. Part of the reason why I love to do that is so that you guys are released to disciple and love others, and we get to hear about the stories of that the next week. That's really the foundation of what the church is all about. And it's not just about what God is doing here in our church and in our lives. It's about what God is doing around the world because there are great movements of God. The church is growing more than ever. I know here in the West it doesn't feel like that, that's because we're a sleeping giant that needs to be poked and prodded and waked up a little bit. But the church is growing exponentially in countries like China, on, in countries in the continent of Africa and South America. Like The church is growing faster than we've ever seen it before because people are not just gathering in buildings like this. They're discipling one another. Like they're getting back to the heart of the great commission to go and make disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and then teaching others to obey the commandments that Jesus has given them. That is true heart of what the church should be doing. And I know that there are many of us, and I'm not trying to shame anyone because I feel so passionate about this because I've been in church for, I've been working in church for like 15 years now and I have missed the boat on a lot of this. I felt like, well, if I just keep leading worship and I keep preaching or teaching, then I'm covered. But like I've been discipled and I've done a really crappy job of discipling others. So shame on me, I guess. But we want to see this continue to happen in our lives and in our church. And uh, we've been blessed to have three young adults um, enter something called YWAM recently. And so Sydney and Ben and Isaac are going to meet me on the stage here. And uh, I've asked them to come to share some stories about how God is moving around the world. Because sometimes here in the West, we get comfortable with what is happening in the here and the now and in our workplaces or even in the four walls of this building. You guys can come on up. And, but what we don't see sometimes is the way that the kingdom of God is moving and growing around the world. And these three young adults have had a really um, interesting opportunity uh, with YWAM, which means Youth with a Mission. And 
you go for about three months and you just do the word of God, right? You get biblically literate about what it means to serve Jesus. And then they're like, okay, great. That's not enough. We're going to send you out. You're actually going to do that. And so then each of them have spent uh, about three months or so serving in different countries around the world. So can you uh, join me in welcoming Sydney and Isaac and Ben to stage? Um, I would just maybe for, for these guys, start by maybe telling them where your like, home base was um, for the first three months and then maybe where you went uh, on, your, on your mission. Ladies first, I guess. Okay, so I went to Waiwai Maui, Maui, Hawaii. That was where my base was. That's too bad. Yeah, it was pretty nice. Um, and then for my outreach, I spent two weeks in Thailand, and then I spent nine weeks in the Himalayas. Yeah, um, so I was in Alyssa, Norway. Uh, me and Ben both were. Um, so we were there for three months learning, and then I went on my missions phase in the UK. So we spent some time in Paisley, Scotland, which is just as I Glasgow, and uh, then we spent a month in Liverpool, and then two weeks in this little farm town called Highworth. And like Isaac said, I'm Ben, and I also went to Alison, Norway. And then for my outreach location, I went to Mexico, um, both coasts, back and forth twice. So I went Mazatlan, Veracruz, Puebla, Acapulco, and Mexico City. Very cool. And tell me about your guys' like, prep phase. I'm, I'm interested to know um, what that looked like. So, you know, you're, you're together with all these other young adults, and you're opening God's Word, and you're learning about certain things. Like, tell me about your prep phase. Tell me one thing maybe that you learned about Jesus through the Word, or something that um, that you learned in that part of the trip. All right. During preparation phase, for me, uh, we really learned the importance of uh, spending your alone time with God and uh, reading your Bible, um, and how you can't live your life half on with God and half off. Um, otherwise, it's not living out your faith. Um, so if you show up to the lectures and you do everything, but then afterwards you completely change to a different person, um, you're not really living in the relationship with God that he wants you to be. Um, yeah. And when you're living in with uh, what God wants for your life and not just what you think is best for your life and you follow his steps, uh, he's going to make a way for you to do amazing things. Yeah, uh, for me, so we were both part of this outdoor track, which uh, basically means we just got to do a bunch of stuff outside and rock climbing, hiking, everything. So going in, I was like, yeah, God, he's very creative God. He created everything um, from no template, so he has to be creative. Um, but then really with all the hiking we did and just being outside and seeing his creation, it really just showed me like, wow, our God is, he is creative. Like he created everything we see and he created us in his image and his likeness and he created us creative. So then that means God has to be creative as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it just, uh, that time was really, really a time that showed like, wow, our God is, yeah, he's just an amazing God who is creative, and yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, so during lecture phase, um, there's like 12 different weeks of um, topics, I guess, and during one of the weeks um, called Father Heart of God, we learned a lot about the Father Heart of God, so what it means for God to be a father, and I think for me, one of the biggest things that stood out to me um, throughout the entire lecture phase was that um, God is my father and that he loves me and I grew up like knowing that I grew up hearing that I feel like it's such a common thing we say like Jesus loves you um, but I think the biggest thing for me was really understanding um, the depth of that really understanding um, the ugliness of my sin and then being able to, from there to understand the beauty of what Jesus did on the cross and um, yeah just taking it back to the very beginning where um, in the garden, um, you know, sin had not entered yet. Sin was not a thing. And so um, everyone had um, things gone the way that um, God had originally planned them. We wouldn't need to be telling people about Jesus. And so I think for me, realizing that helped me to see that um, my purpose in um, being alive isn't um, or wasn't originally to tell people about Jesus. Jesus didn't um, need me to do something for him. He created me just to be with him and to dwell with him and to love him. And I think that was like, yeah, that was like the biggest thing for me, just learning that God loves me for who I am, not for what I can do for him. Good. Um, I'm sure probably one of the bigger questions that we'll have to ask here since you've been in so many different countries is did you eat anything fun or funny? I had the best food of my life in Mexico. Um... <laughs> So yeah, I uh, had tacos like every other night. 
Oh. Uh, my total taco count was about 180 by the time I came <laughs> home. That's awesome. Um, yeah, but just everything they make there is so flavorful, so amazing. Nothing, nothing weird, I would say. Well, Isaac, you were in Scotland for a while, so please tell me you had haggis. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I had beans on toast a couple times, but that's really about it. Um, I'd say it's a little different than Mexico, not as flavorful. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it, it is what it is. It was good. Beans on toast is surprisingly okay. Yeah. Great. Um, I think the weirdest thing I tried was in Thailand. I tried a cricket and a chicken foot. Ooh. Yeah. Neat. So, so after your three months or so of kind of like this prep phase, tell me one thing you learned about serving Jesus. Uh, in these various countries that you guys were in? Like, what was, what was something that you're just like, needs to, that you saw that you're like, oh, this needs to translate where I am or where I live? Like, so well, yeah, what did you learn about God as you served in your various countries? Um, yeah, so for me, starting off at Reach, uh, we started in Scotland, and there's lots of big change happening in my life, so um, leaving Norway, leaving everybody I lived with, lived with for the last three months. It was obviously going to be hard, but I didn't really expect it to be as hard as it was. Um, so then, yeah, getting to Scotland around start of December, um, it's also when school applications have to be in for like college and university. So there's just a lot of stress, a lot of worry in my life. And uh, we, at that time, our outreach leaders, uh, they challenged us to read the New Testament during outreach. So uh, when I was really worried about everything, I read Matthew 6, and that talks about why we don't have to worry because God has everything under control. And so just reading that, it was like the perfect time. God had me read that at that time. And it was just, wow, this is exactly what I needed to hear. And now I can share what I've read here with people I see on the street and just meet in my everyday life. So that was kind of like a, a testimony, I guess, is just, yeah, we don't have to worry about anything because God's got everything under control. He has a plan for you. And yeah, why worry? Mm, that's good. Uh, the thing that I learned, I would say, is um, how overwhelming God pres God's presence is in a room. Um, when you're praying and being active in your faith and living it out, and you walk into a room, you can just feel the calming presence of uh, him being there beside you and walking beside you and all that. Um, and every time that you walk into a room where a need needs to be met or there's someone who needs to hear something or you're working on something that you cannot do in your own strength and you just feel that little boost of encouragement or just some little, little bit of extra strength, you're a little bit too tired and you just feel God's presence pour over you. It's so overwhelming every single time. Um, and just how you can look forward to having someone who wants that relationship and stand beside you in those hard times. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think the, the thing that stands out to me the most is just learning the Lord's heart for his people. Um, so in the Himalayas, we um, built a, a relationship with a family there, and we had different ministries that we were doing um, throughout our time there, but I really sensed the Lord was telling me that this one family was kind of my main ministry there. Um, it was kind of like an on-the-way ministry uh, in my own time type of ministry. And um, yeah, we would just go up and spend time with them. And um, I really sensed that the Lord was, like I know that he had called me um, to do YWAM and to do outreach for so many different reasons, but I really sensed that one of the biggest reasons was that family. And just to see that um, he would call someone across the world for the sake of, of a few people um, because he wants them to know him and he wants um, them to know that he loves them is, is just so evident of his heart for people and, and how intentional he is and how um, he'll do anything to pursue people and, yeah, to run after them. That's good. Uh, can each of you maybe tell a story that may have changed your perspective on Jesus or the church or maybe even people in general? Like one of those stories that's like only God, like not the ones that you can make up, um, but like that, that was only God. Do you guys have that, any of those kinds of stories? <laughs> um, yeah, so I would say, so my, 
my own personal experience um, going into uh, the outreach phase was um, very hard. Um, so the, the week that we were supposed to leave, um, I absolutely freaked out. I was terrified of so many different things when it came to going on outreach and leaving what was comfortable and familiar and walking into so many unknowns. And um, yeah, I actually got to a point where I was like 99% sure I was not going and I was going to give up and come home. And I, um, I really believed the lies that the enemy was speaking, telling me that I wasn't capable and that I couldn't do it. Um, but uh, I spent a lot of time that week praying and crying and having many conversations. And something that the Lord spoke to me um, very clearly was, I will meet all of your needs. And um, yeah, I walked through the next three months um, truly not knowing if I would make it to the end, truly not knowing if I would be able to um, get through a lot of different situations. Um, yeah, I experienced a lot of spiritual warfare. I experienced a lot of sickness. And um, I got to the end, and I walked across the stage at graduation, and I knew that the only way I had made it through uh, the last three months was the Lord. Um, it wasn't because of my own strength. It wasn't because of um, my own capabilities or, um, yeah, it wasn't something that I did on my own. It was, it was genuinely, truly only because of the Lord. And I think it was a really cool thing for me to learn that um, I can't do things without him and I don't need to try. And, yeah, it was only because of him. Um, yeah, so for me, it was also around like the start of outreach, well, before that, uh, when we learned our outreach teams, um, my team was the biggest team of all the teams that were going out, and um, on my team, I felt like I hadn't connected to anybody, and it was the people I talked to the least, um, gotten to know the least, and had the least in common with, just, I was, remember thinking to myself, this is going to be a really long three months, I don't know if it's going to work, um, this, yeah, this will be rough. Um, so then starting outreach uh, in Scotland, I just, uh, yeah, I just remember praying, like, God, please, can you just help me through this time? Can you help me connect with these people? Um, just create relationships with these people so we can uh, just work together just to spread your love. And, yeah, so then over time, uh, everything gradually got, uh, like, not, I don't want to say better because it wasn't bad, but um, it just seemed to just to flow nicer. And turns out that I actually, I have a lot in common with those people. And... Um, yeah, those people on my team are the people I'm most in contact with now, and I feel like I've grown the closest to, and honestly have the most in common with, and they help me get out of my comfort zone a lot. Um, I started crocheting, which I never thought I'd do. <laughs> um, not very good at it, so still learning, but that's pretty fun. Um, and I, I like coffee now, hated it before, so yeah, um, but it really just shows that like, me thinking, oh, this is going to be terrible. And God's like, no, I got a plan for you. I got a plan for this team. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it may be hard at times, but we're going to do some good work. And uh, yeah, so it really just shows yeah, his plan for us. Um, yeah, so it was a big thing for me. That's good. That's great. So for me, it's uh, another beginning of outreach story. Um, so I'm going on outreach. I'm super excited. I have a good team. I'm very happy to go. I'm going to Mexico. It's warm. I'm getting out of the snowy Norway. Um, I have my bag packed. We're getting on the plane and we're going to Mexico. And uh, we have a 56 hour travel day. And unfortunately for me, I cannot sleep in situations like that. So I was up for two and a half days straight. Um, and then we arrive in our first location and we get like five hours to sleep the first night, and immediately we're out the door the next day, meeting the base, um, going on our first ministry, doing everything, and just trying to work on this very minimal amount of sleep. And you're already exhausted. It's your first day. Your body's sore because of the work that you were doing. And I remember getting home and just lying in my bed, and I'm like, I don't want to do this for three months. Like, this is not going to be enjoyable. I don't have it in me. And I kept pushing for about two weeks, and uh, we reached the end of our first location. And I'm just like, if I want to go home, now would be the time. I'm completely exhausted. My body's worn down. I'm mentally just tired all the time. I'm snappy at people because I'm just so done with everything. 
And I remember at that point, I like reached a breaking point where I had to fall back on something because I'm so used to relying on myself mm. to just be strong enough to deal with things. And um, I realized that alone, I was not going to make it through these next couple months. Um, I needed something backing me and giving me the energy and the strength to go out and serve this community. And uh, then I remembered everything that we learned for the past three months. And I said I absorbed it, and it was in my brain and everything, but I wasn't putting it into practice. Um, and that was just to let God take control of the reins, let him take over what plans he has for those next couple months, and let him show me how I can best serve the community. And um, once you shut your brain off and let him take over, or not mm. shut your brain off, but um, just give him the control that he needs to do good things, it's so much more peaceful, and it's so much more relaxing, and you can just sit there in God's presence and enjoy just being where you're at. And he's going to use you however he can and whenever he can. And it doesn't seem like you're alone anymore because you just have him backing you all the time. And, um, yeah. So after those two weeks, um, when I reached my breaking point, I was at an energy high for the next month and a half. So I don't know if we started eating better food or something, but, um, yeah, that was my story. Good. Um, I, I, I find it interesting that all three of you guys had, um, it seems, maybe the most uh, either tension or the most uh, you know, anxiety or whatever you might want to call it, right before you go from like the learning to the doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like that's what that Dallas Willard quote is touching on there. There's this, there's this group, there's this generation of Christians who know and are learning and are here and are showing up and are ready. And then it's that crossing that threshold to doing the work of the Spirit. I don't think that like shutting off your mind is, I think that's appropriate to say, you know, in, in Romans 12, we see that God wants to change us through, uh, we want to see renewal through the transformation of how we think. It's, it's, an, it's a letting go of how we think and how we perceive to letting the Spirit show us and use us in what we do and how he uses it. So I think that's completely appropriate. And I love that you guys all shared that same tension of um, being the church and then going and doing the church things and being a part of the kingdom and knowing and, and reading and experiencing, but then going and doing and practicing the life of Jesus. That's hard. And so kudos to all you guys for overcoming that tension because that's where the church is at. That's, that's, the, that's the sleeping giant right there, right? It, it, it's getting the church to go beyond the four walls of this place and doing the life of Jesus outside and poking and prodding at that sleeping giant. I love that. Tell me one thing that you, maybe that you saw in those countries that the church may be missing here in North America, in the West. Like I know, Isaac, you were kind of, you know, the UK is kind of still like the church in the West in a lot of ways, but um, what did you see in those countries during your serving time that the church might be missing here in, in, uh, in, at Sea Road, even? One thing that um, I find about the church in Mexico is... Um, the church for them is not a building. It's not a place they attend every Sunday and where they go when they need that um, connection or to feel something. The church is the community that surrounds them. It's oh, so the good. people that they're living their faith lives out with and um, sharing everything that's going on with them. They back each other up. Um, they help them through the good times uh, and or help them through the bad times and celebrate the good times together. And... Um, the most powerful church that I went to in all of outreach was meeting out of a hotel room's lobby wow. because they didn't have a permanent location. But they were just so on fire all the time that it didn't matter where they met. They could have met in someone's basement if they needed to, and they would have still had the same energy as mm -hmm. a mega church in Texas. They're just so powerful in living out their faith and sharing their relationship with each other that... Um, they're there to back each other up, 
in anything. They're giving out food to each other. They're helping out the people that are going through struggles. And it's just that community of living out God's work and not leaving it at church on Sunday. You take that home and you live it out for the rest of your week. And that'll preach. Uh, yeah, so for me, like Jamie said, UK, it's pretty, pretty Western. It's really similar to Canada, same with Norway. Um, so I wasn't really in like different cultures really. Um, but one thing I picked up just while I was gone was just worship culture. Um, how I think a big thing was just not having a fear of man when it comes to worship um, and just letting it be a moment between you and God because that's what it is. You're, it's like, yeah, it boils down to this is a moment I'm just worshiping God. It's just be between me and him. It's not what your neighbor on the left thinks. Oh, this person raised their arm. That's funny. Um, or this person standing with their arms down. That's also funny. It's, yeah, I think that's one thing that we could, me included, could just really adopt is just having no fear of man when it comes to worship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I really experienced that while we were in Norway, um, just with the community we had around us, um, just when we had our weekly worship nights, it was just, okay, this is, yeah, like I said, a moment between me and God, and um, it's like I'm the only one in the room. I'm just not going to really care what other people think because I just want to spend this time with God um, and just thank him for everything he's doing. Um, that's great. So, yeah, I think that's one thing that is, uh, yeah, I don't want to say missing, but... Um, is definitely something that's really important to have in a church here in the West and all over the world. That's good. Yeah, um, I think for me, it's kind of similar to Ben. Um, everything there was just so raw and real, and um, it didn't matter where they were meeting. Um, the church that I attended in the Himalayas was at someone's house on the roof, and it consisted of like six adults and 23 children, and it was just so simple, but it was so real and so raw and so genuine and so sincere. And it wasn't about a performance. It wasn't about what people thought. It was just they loved Jesus and they just wanted to be obedient to him and to show their love for him and their actions toward other people, um, toward him. So, yeah. Last question is, is similar, um, but I think when we, when we hear different perspectives, it, it helps frame the question a bit differently, but from your recent perspectives, is Holy Spirit doing or saying something in other parts of the world that the church in the West might be missing out on? Like, do you feel like the Spirit is saying something in different areas of the world that we might be missing out on? Um, I think just having a disciplined faith. Um, like Ben was saying earlier, it's more than just like, okay, it's church on a Sunday, so I'm going to use this hour and a half, and this will be my, my good deed for the week or something. It's, um, yeah, just having a disciplined faith. Um, we were really encouraged to um, just spend time with Jesus during, like, during our quiet time and then just throughout the day, even if you weren't feeling it, like, oh, today sucks, I don't want to read my Bible, but I'm going to because this is how I'm going to grow. Like, you don't see an athlete only working out on day C has motivation. You see them working out um, even when they don't want to because that's how you improve. And that's how you improve in a relationship with God is doing it when you don't want to. So I think, yeah, just being really disciplined um, and doing things like reading your Bible when you don't want to, praying when things suck and they're not just good. Um, yeah, just being disciplined in it. Yeah, I think mine would be very similar. Um, I think they are very committed to their faith. Um, that's something that I really saw. And I think in the West, we are very committed to our experience. I think it's all about the experience that we get. And I think something that, um, something that the Lord was really speaking to me about was that it's not, um, it's not about how it feels. It's not about an experience. It's about a choice. Um, it's about a vow to the Lord. It's the same as in marriage. Like, you don't just vow to love someone when you feel like it. No one's going to want to marry you if you're just vowing to love someone when you feel like it. And it's the same with the Lord. Like, he, he wants us to vow to love him, uh, whether we experience anything or not, whether we feel anything or not. It's an active, everyday choice to walk by the Spirit, to choose life, to, to choose him, to choose to be obedient to him, to choose to love him. And, and it isn't just on Sunday. It's an every single day choice to spend time in the Word, to spend time um, praying, to spend your own time in worship, to spend time seeking the Lord and asking him for revelation, asking him to yeah, show us more of who he is. And it's a commitment. It's not, it's not about a feeling. That's great. Uh, can we just thank these guys for sharing the story a little bit? And, um, I'm going to invite Pastor Heather, and she's actually going to lead us in a time of prayer. And I, I just want to encourage all of you, like, uh, especially if there are youth or young adults in the room who think like, man, I could really feel like an experience like that would change my perspective and help me along. Like, these guys have all made themselves 
willing and available to chat after service. Uh, and so you can just find them um, just at the very back here. If you want to know more about YWAM, uh, if you want to know maybe more about your experiences or their challenges or what that might mean for someone else's own life, you're welcome to do that. Uh, at the same page, if you are one who wants to continue to help us try to wake the sleeping giant as a community, and you want to know more about disciple, what it means to uh, be uh, a disciple of Jesus and help disciple others, you can talk to myself or Pastor Heather. Uh, if you know Dave and Catherine Beatty, they would also love to have a conversation with you about that. Or if you're even someone who's new to church, new to the community, and new to faith, and you want to know what it means to follow Jesus, you can, for both those things, you can go to crow.ca slash groups. Can we thank these guys one more time as Pastor Heather leads us in a time of prayer? Yeah.